and we'll have health care right on premise. Now that to me makes sense. So those are the type of things that I'm looking to do in the next three or four years. Next three years. Hopefully if we find the right person to replace you, we can get this going in the next 11 years and then by the time I get into the nursing home, <laughs> it'll be prosperous. <laughs> What I'd like to do now is uh, open it up for questions. Because I tell you, that's really where it's all about, is knowing what you need to have happen in our state. And we, we do this every day. I, I, have, uh, I do town hall meetings every week. I will continue to do those. I find those to be the most invigorating part of being a governor. And I also have uh, office hours on Saturday morning where people come in and visit with me and uh, I find out what really goes on around the state. I have learned more about the state of Maine with my Saturday morning meetings than any professional or any lobbyist can provide me. I get it right from the horse's mouth and we can help. Believe me, we've helped a lot of people on Saturday mornings because they're simple little things. Sometimes it's a misunderstanding, sometimes it's a misreading of the law, sometimes it's reading a law that was passed in 1800 and it's still on the books and they're still thinking that, do you know that it's a, it's a crime in Maine to spit on the sidewalk? So I'm watching you. <laughs> tell you, I don't have to drive anymore. I have a driver, so we go around, I'm watching it. <laughs> so with that, anybody have any questions? Yes, sir, right there. Carl. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Governor, thank you. Um, so you came out, uh, you were at Simone's Hot Dog the other day, right? What's that? You were at Simone's Hot Dogs the yes, other day. Yes, I was. And you came out in, uh, in favor of uh, the Charter Commission uh, and the Unification of Lewiston and Auburn. And as somebody who uh, lives in Lewiston and works in Auburn, uh, I also see great potential in this. What has been your, your feedback since you've uh, made those statements? Uh, I haven't heard from anybody, really. But let me tell well, you, there you go. <laughs> let, let, let me tell you, I, I served on three charter commissions. Um, I will tell you, Wilson Auburn has got one of the greatest opportunities. <laughs> the greatest opportunity to make, to make this area and put the state of Maine on the map. And I will tell you why. The biggest problem in the Northeast is home rule. We all want it, we all love it. And I will tell you, when I was the mayor of Waterville, you talked about taking my home rule away, and you were in trouble, big trouble. <laughs> because I want to make all the decisions. I want to make the decisions for my schools. I want everybody wants to be in their backyard making a decision. Then I became governor, and it's very, very expensive. For instance, we have some 400 public works directors in the state of Maine. <laughs> I have one director, and we do all the state roads, and I think he's the brightest DOT commissioner that I've seen in the state of Maine in at least my adult life. I think Dave Bernhardt, when I'm gone from Delta, if they don't hire Keith Dave Bernhardt as commissioner, something's wrong. He's apolitical, he could care less about politics, he's an engineer by trade, and he loves to work on roads. And he can stretch a dollar like you've never seen. <laughs> and so he's very, very good. The whole, and why, why I use roads is why, why don't we have county roads instead of local roads? Why do we have 179,000 kids in our schools in the state of Maine with 127 superintendents. 127, the state of Florida has three million kids, 64 superintendents. State of Florida's education is ranked number seven 
Well, they fight in between seven and eight, between Massachusetts and Florida are, are fighting for seventh and eighth place, while we're 38. We spent $250 million more than any other state in America on education, on, on administration of our education system. The average budget, school district budget in America, is 2% of the budget. In Maine, it's 4.5%. We have superintendents that have less students than a high school, the average high school in America. So, is there room for, for consolidating and for working together? Yes. And I'll tell you something, if you're working together in one direction, it gets done much faster. So I think Lewis and Auburn, and this is where I see the strength. Auburn has a good geography, it's got a lot of land. Lewiston has got a lot to offer in the sense of the hospitals and, and uh, Bates College, which helps us put us on the map. Both of, them, both of you have your own issues on taxation. Somebody said, well, there's more people in Lewiston and less people in Auburn, and therefore Lewiston's going to have to say, that's not how it works, though. You do it by districts. And you're going to take 60,000 people and divide it by the number of seats that you have on your council. So you're going to have some counselors will have some people in Auburn, some people in Austin. It can't, you can't help but do that. So what I'm suggesting is you can really have a, a critical mass that will match Portland, and you can become the economic engine because Portland's all built up. And I'm saying, wow. You know, you, we can really put the energy together. Yesterday I had a meeting with uh, a Chinese gentleman who's head of the public paper industry in China. And another individual was with us from Scandinavia, public paper Scandinavia. Printing paper is really gone. We know that. Magazines and all that, it's way down. But let me tell you something. In China, they have 1.2 billion people, nearly 1.3 billion people. India has a billion people. You know what a growing market is? Tissue. It's a growing market. That's what we were talking about. The other thing that we're talking about is cardboard. China has some of the worst cardboard manufacturing in the world. When you recycle cardboard, they don't take Chinese cardboard. No, seriously, I'm not kidding. It, it just doesn't fit in the recycling process. It's a really terrible process that they have. And that's what they want to do. They want to come, they're looking here. We have two tissue machines that went into Woodland, Maine. Mr. Chu now is looking. I call him Mr. Chu. <laughs> He's a good guy. He owns all the hotels in, a whole lot of hotels in China. <laughs> He's a great, great guy. Now he's thinking of, hey, instead of sending the parrot rolls to Virginia, why don't we finish them in Maine? Send a finished product. So we have an opportunity. And most of Arbor, I think I've, I've met the uh, people who are looking to invest into uh, uh, medical tourism here in Maine, in Los Arbor area, big money. Big, big money. I met the lady who heads it up, and she's a billionaireess. Many times over, she could give Donald Trump a run for his money. <laughs> so they're looking to invest. And I will tell you, while they're very slow in making decisions, uh, they're very cautious, uh, they're very, very faithful. Now, we've had... It, and when they make a dialogue with you, they're very faithful in getting back to you and discussing. We've had, I've been over uh, a few times, and they've been over here a few times, so we're moving ahead. And it's, it's a slow process when you deal with Pacific Rim country in, relate, in the relationship building, because it is very, very big in relationships. Uh, so I really believe that Lewis and Robert has got a absolutely great opportunity.
but I will tell you what I've, what I've noticed and you need to take care of if you're gonna get this done. As I understand your charter commission is like six people, too small. You gotta have a dozen people on there. And if you don't have city councilors and the mayor of the mayor of both cities and city councilors on that commission, you will fail. I'm just gonna tell you, been there three times, you will fail. The reason you're gonna fail is it's gonna be us them. Because if you if you don't have us them on the charter commission and showing the people that they can work together and they can work, it won't work. I'm just giving you some and you know, you didn't ask for it, you're not paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm in the solar industry. Oh, hey, I was mayor last time. No, no. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the solar industry is growing all around the country. In New England, uh, most other New England states are surpassing what we're doing here in Maine. And um, I read an article the other day where there's more people working in the solar industry nationally than in the gas and oil industry right now. So solar is growing like crazy. Um, we're behind the rest of New England states. What can we do to bring young workers in to this state that love solar to make solar grow here in the state? Well, first of all, you answered your own question. You said the other New England states are ahead of us in solar. But the other New England states' energy is more costly than me. You answered your own question. Now, to get, if you want to get Young people here that want solar, very simple. Investment capital and people go where they're welcome and stay where they're appreciated. It's that simple. It is that simple. And as long, and I will tell you about solar. <coughs> solar in Maine is going to give you 14% efficiency. In Texas, it gives you 21% efficiency. Governor Rick Perry of Texas told me, he says, you know, wind has got some data. It's better than solar. Now, I'm not suggesting that wind and solar aren't good. What I'm suggesting is they're boutique industries. They're not a baseline, a base industry. They're boutique, meaning sun shines here in Maine 12 hours a day, then you have snowstorms, you have rainstorms, you have cloudy days, and the sun, at that point, the solar is very, very inefficient. I, we have a, if you go to Augusta now, if you get up to the uh, 95, you're gonna see two signs, two yield signs blinking. The one on the left blinks significantly more than the one on the right. And the reason why, the shadows of the trees stop it from generating electricity. So that's how finicky it is. Now, does that mean that there's not a future? Of course there's a future. But the future's in the battery storage, and we're not there yet. So I encourage every, everyone to keep working on the industry. Once you can, you can store the electricity that generates into a battery and use it when you need it, then you have an industry. You can be a base load. But right now, what is happening is this. Take wind, for instance. We have about 800 megawatts of wind now. No, about uh, 500 megawatts of wind going to 3,500. The problem with wind is this. To generate wind power, your transmission line's got to be about four inches because you've got to take it when, they make, when it's made because you're not storing it. But your usage is only, you only need a wire this big, so it's three times the cost to, tra to transmit. So if you could store it in batteries and use it when you wanted to, then the whole cost drops down. And it makes it a really viable industry. So uh, I think wind and solar have a future. It's just not there yet. I think it's probably another 15, 20 years before it's there. In the meantime, we have 41,000 megawatts of hydroelectricity that's looking for a place. We could be buying cheaper energy from Canada and bring a pipeline in, and then you could solve our problem. So I think that while 
wind and solar, and we haven't talked about the best one yet. No carbon footprint, nuclear. And if you think you're not gonna have nuclear in the future, uh, forget it, we're gonna have nuclear in the future. Because you're gonna be forced into it. Because right now in Maine, what's happening, you heard me say earlier, underemployment of Mainers. The reason we're already employed is our energy costs are so high, to keep the lights on, we gotta pay the bill first. And that extra cost of energy is coming out of your paycheck to a great extent because you're part of the operating cost. Labor's part of the operating cost. Energy's part of the operating cost. And so it's a very complex issue. But I do think that there's a future for it. It's just not today. It's just like never be the first one to buy the first car off the line. <laughs> And we're not ready for that. And, and I think that Maine deserves to have low-cost electricity and low-cost low fuel for natural gas. The fact that you have natural gas, look what's happening to oil. Anyone else? Governor, we have time for one more question. Oh, my God. I, should, I came <laughs> early to speak longer. <laughs> I'm on. Thank you for being here, Governor. And as a school superintendent, I won't mind being voted out of the line. I would appreciate uh, some more uh, understanding about your pulling the uh, nomination of Mr. Dr. Beardsley to be Commissioner of Education. Uh, the department, as I know you know, has, has not had uh, uh, dedicated leadership for a while now. And just, that department needs leadership, and how do you see that being solved? Thank you. Yeah. You're absolutely right, and it, it broke my heart to have to pull that nomination, but he was going to get defeated. It was going to go down 7 6. The Democrats said that they were not going to support him. Uh, this way, here, I can keep him. He keeps working, and when his acting commissioner status leaves, he will, he will be the deputy commissioner, and I will be the commissioner. That way there I can keep them. Otherwise, I would have lost them. And they and they have nothing against him. It's not Dr. Beardsley that they're after. If you've heard, you might have heard, they tried to impeach me this year. There's so much hatred by the leadership of the, the Democrats in the House uh, that there's nothing I can do that will solve anything. Uh, that's why if I send a bill up to the legislature, so, uh, Representative Grant this week says to me, well, why don't you give us a comprehensive plan for the drug crisis? Because they will die. Because it's all rhetoric, it's all games, fun and games. This is what's wrong with Augusta. This is why I say about elections, elections have consequences. And if you want change, you've got to change the people that go to Augusta. And that's the reason why I, took, I pulled it. I pulled it because he had no chance of surviving. And just, they were going to do to Dr. Beardsley as they did to Susan Dench when I put her up for the University of Maine. And then they tried the same stunt with uh, the doctor, the uh, PUC commissioner that came in from Texas, who, I mean, uh, Tennessee, who's written several books. He worked for the federal government in, en in energy. He's written several books in, in energy. He's an economist, and they wanted to have what, they, what I call the Yes Show. The N word. <laughs> I could have spelled it out for you. <laughs> I'm leaving a little bit to your imagination. No, that's what happened. And it's a sad day when that's what we had to do. And, I, and I'll tell you why I did it is the department has had some difficulty. Uh, the first commissioner elected to move on to uh, how, you know, other parts of education. Commissioner Ryer got ill, as you know, and he had to, he was forced to retire. I brought in Tom Desjardins, and they were gonna do the same for Tom. Then I figured, well, Bill Beardley, president of the university, has got an impeccable career 
I said, nobody, nobody would go after him. Sure enough, they said, they, we knew he wasn't going to make it. And so I said, I'm going to pull him. I'm going to put him back over there as the acting, and he will be the commissioner for the rest of my term. Thank you so much for being here.